make yourself comfortable because this is going to be a while. <laughs> Scripture readings today is in Matthew 13, 31 through 33, and 44 through 51. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and <clears throat> perch in its branches. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field. A man found it, he hid it again. And then his joy, he went and sold all he had and brought that, bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one, was great value. He went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into a lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in a basket, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied, and so be it. Um, that food and everything that's available. So I thought about this verse um, when we were doing our prayer requests and everything. Now I've got to find it. Actually, I can find it easier this way. You know, in John chapter 17, you should be kind of familiar with it, that Jesus prayed. He prayed for all believers. But at the end of John chapter 16, don't forget these words, because in this world we will face trouble. And what's so amazing about these words is immediately after Jesus says these words, He prayed for us. Prayed for us that we could go through the trials and tribulations that we would face. Know that we were never alone, that He was always by our side, that He would bring us comfort. And we're here to bring each other comfort because we have the Spirit uh, abiding in us. But verse 31 through 33 of John 16, he says, Do you now believe? A time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And that's fitting for where we're at in Acts because we're at that point where persecution is going to come to the church. But we also get to see the example of how they live and the prayer that they ask for when they're faced with persecution. So before I pray, before we get started on the sermon, I'd like to do a little game first. Okay? I need your participation. Can you do that? I'm going to say something and then you finish my statement, okay? To be or? Good job. Four score and seven years ago. That's all, it's fine. That's all you need to do. Give me liberty. Approved workman. Good job. Study to? Oh, my soul is happy. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's rejoice. Okay, so you were able to finish the Awana anacronym, that's what that, or acronym, that's what that is. Approved workmen are not ashamed. That's what it stands for. That's why you guys committed to Awanas, and I'm so tickled and so happy. Keep praying. Invite people. Keep serving. 
And we've got a little different this year. We've got more cubbies than we've ever had. We'll have to do some changes. We'll have to let another week fall, fall and see who comes because I know some people didn't come that, uh, that texted me or emailed me, said we can't come this week, but we'll come next week. But we'll figure out all those dynamics. We'll try to plug you in as much as possible. Continue to pray. You guys also continue to study to be an approved workman so that you can help teach these kids. You've got the Awana curriculum in front of you laid out, but some of you will face questions that you're answered and everything else. And it's a time for you to study God's Word so that you can teach these future disciples. There's a thing in the Bible that we call the Great Commission that talks about that, teaching them to obey all that Jesus has commanded us. So I'm going to pray and then we'll get started. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that your word is alive, that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, that it is God-breathed, that it is literally your love letter to us for instruction, for training in righteousness, for reproof and all the different things, Lord. Lord, help us to not take your word lightly, but to eat it and to devour it and to know that how sweet it is, but yet the bitterness too, that you have called us to be an obedient servant that will follow you, that will forsake everything and take up our cross to follow after Jesus, but to find out that that's not really bitter, it's bittersweet. If we gave up everything, that would be to our profit, our gain, because we would build up treasures in heaven, and we would serve you and bring glory and honor to you. So we ask that thy will be done and thy kingdom come. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I told you last week about Paul's words to Timothy. And Paul's words in Timothy, um, our verses from 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul's words prior to that, and this will be another sermon for another day, but if you read at the beginning of that chapter, Paul says that we are to study so that we can be dedicated to teaching these future Christians. And he compares it, and I preached about this before, probably will again, and maybe hopefully again after that, and maybe hopefully again after that. But he compares these, this studying to three, to three different individuals. A soldier, okay? A soldier goes in trained, he goes in equipped. You know, he goes in, knows he's fighting a war, and he goes in to win. An athlete, why, why would you ever compete to lose? You compete to win, you train up. You, 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 the more effort you put in, the more you get out of it. Not necessarily the same there, but, but there, there are correlations. And a farmer. You know, a farmer, if he doesn't do his work diligently, we don't have food and we don't live. We die. To not go into a sermon, I just want to give you those ideas so that you would understand that we need to be devoted to the kingdom of God. Our biggest ministry in this church is Awana. Right now, it's primarily, I mean, I don't know what you do on your own, but we can't do hair care right now, right? We still can't really do it and other things. We're um, doing some Sunday schools and so forth, but our big focus and the participation, I don't know how many are in here again, but nearly half of you were at Awana, and I'm not saying there were, uh, you others weren't serving by any means. I know you were praying. I know you're, you're part of the body. But Awana, I just want to point out the importance of this ministry and the importance of training up our children. And you need to pray because they're facing in this world today so many other things, so many lies and deceptions in this world, and even in the church some of us went to the Awana training yesterday, and that's part of what was talked about in some of the classes is the lies that even come from inside the church because the, the bodies, the people inside the church aren't trained up enough to handle the Word of God to know a lie from the truth. So you need to be studying so that you're not guilty of that, that you can train up your children. And I guarantee you, you'll find a blessing in it. We only had two trek. One T and T? We have five T and T. Okay. So our older children are not represented quite as strongly as our new children, our younger children. That may change, but there's a prayer concern that's going to go already to me that we're not losing these children as they get older. And even a more important thing of grounding our children even younger so that they don't walk away when they're getting older. Satan is battling for their eternal soul. 
Don't forget that. And we have the privilege, we have the power, the authority to combat Satan, and the victory is in Jesus Christ. So will you devote yourself to it? If we don't devote ourselves to Jesus' mission, we won't look like the Acts Church at all. What will our church look like? What will our Awanas look like? And what will you look like on that day when you stand before God as an approved worker or not? Steve and I talked a little bit about it too, about how can we get a little older group to come? How can we get young adults to come? It's going to start with your prayer and the fact that we're with one mind devoted to the ministry of spreading the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So I ask you before I start the sermon. Yes, Steve. let Steve give the next sermon when I'm not here. He did a pretty good job. I know. I was going to sit down is what I was going to do, but I was like, no, I won't do that. <laughs> I want to preach, but I'll try to watch time, I promise you. Because I haven't started the sermon. Don't go, uh-huh. So I have to ask you, are you committed, just like the Acts Church, I mean, it's, it's not coincidence that we're going right here to see what they did, facing persecution, I don't know about you, but I think we're going to be facing persecution in the future. So what in the world are we waiting for now? We need to, to get as urgent in the message as the Acts Church was. One reason that they were so uh, urgent is they thought that Jesus Christ was returning in their lifetime. That's only one reason. Don't think that was the reason. So many times you'll read, oh, that's the reason the church was that way. No, they were that way because they prayerfully prayed for the Holy Spirit. They understood the power. They clung on Jesus' words. They didn't listen to one thing and say, well, I, I, I'll understand this one. I'll follow this to Jesus, but we'll put this one aside for another day. It was their life's passion to follow God because He loved them enough to send His only begotten Son. So I ask you, are you committed to ministry, especially with the time we all have left, whatever it is, if it's one breath or 1,742,000 breaths, I don't know what that equals. Are you committed? The very first thing to do, first period, is to devote yourself to prayer. Okay? So I am going to begin this message, which is called the church's response. Because that's what we're going to see in Acts chapter 4. And Merle read some scripture from Matthew that where Jesus taught about the kingdom of heaven. And if you paid any attention to any of those things at all, those words were echoing in the minds, the hearts of these first Christians. They, th they had heard Jesus preach for several years. They thought He was the Messiah. But then their hopes were dashed 
when he died. But now he's risen from the dead, so he must be who he said he is. And they're clinging to and teaching these words and teaching the Old Testament, and it's what they live for, not live for something else and put church a day a week or a day a month or whatever it turns out to be. So I'm going to review a little bit first. In verse 15, so they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and they conferred together. Now I'm going to remind you if you didn't catch what I said last week about this, that means that Peter and John didn't hear this or the man didn't hear this. But Luke wrote about this. So as you're thinking everything, and I love doing this myself because I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I get to thinking and it leads me to God and His sovereignty and His power and His grace. I wonder if Saul was in that room. And I wonder if Saul, Paul, later told Luke about this. He said, you know, I was in that room and I saw the miracle and I saw the, the power and boldness that Peter spoke with and, and I just had to question. And then finally Jesus, you know, was revealed himself to me on the road to Damascus. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's how my mind works. But Peter and John, that's not what they reported to the crowd because they didn't know what they talked about in private. Okay? Verse 17. But to stop this thing, that's the purpose. We fight a spiritual battle, and the religious leaders didn't even know that's what they were doing. To stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name, the name of Jesus. Verse 18, Then they called them again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But, complete opposite, Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes. That's how we need to evaluate and look at things. To listen to you or to Him. You be the judges. That should have been what convicted them, but we don't see any conviction here. As for us, we cannot help but speaking, and they've got the authority and the power to do so about what we've seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all of the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. We have read that the Spirit filled the believers and they spoke the gospel message in tongues. The Spirit filled, they proclaimed. We read again that the Spirit filled not to heal. That wasn't written there with the healing in chapter 3, but we read again in chapter 4 that the Spirit filled and Peter and John proclaimed their defense. They had no idea how to do on their own. It wasn't prepared, just like Peter's sermon wasn't prepared in the beginning. But the Holy Spirit gave them the words to say, which echoes us right back to Jesus' words about don't worry when you face persecution, when you're thrown in, in, in jail. And we're going to see a third feeling now. But we didn't see any conviction, but maybe that came later with some of the religious leaders. Verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chiefs and elders had said to them. Not what they said behind closed doors. What they said to them. So my mind gets to thinking again, what did they say to Peter and John? You've got to stop this. We know this. Or else... So they told him all the or else, the things that Luke doesn't necessarily write here. I don't know about you, but I'd be worried. <laughs> I mean, that's general, the, the, the feeling that would come upon me as a human being. But then I go back to all the times that Jesus said, do not fear. And fear God alone, because he has authority to throw your body and your soul into hell for all eternity. Oh, the beginning of, wis the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. And I think of all these things, so I need to pray. I need to pray for strength. Let's see what they do. Verse 24, when they heard this, they raised up their, raised up their voices together in prayer. If you read and study the Scripture, you'll find that this is one accord, but it doesn't mean that they prayed all at the same time like they did in tongues or anything. It means that you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed quietly, out loud, given terms at a certain time, orderly, whatever reasons. But we had one mindset, one thought process. God, we need your help because of the threats that Peter and John came back and told us about. We also see your mighty miracles. We're not going to turn from proclaiming your name because we know the purpose that we're here for is to proclaim 
proclaim Jesus and the resurrection. But we need help. And we're all united in this same prayer. <clears throat> I have to ask myself, and as a parent, is this a big prayer pattern in my life? And I'm not facing the persecutions that they face. I don't think tomorrow I'm going to be told I'm going to be thrown into prison. I think that might come in my lifetime. I think we'll, I think we'll be censored. But I don't even have that now. And is that a big pattern of my prayer? And are we all in one accord about it? That we want boldness to preach and teach the gospel because there's nothing more important in our lives. And I have to answer for myself again and say I fall very far short of that. Lord, make it a passion in my life. Let me throw off anything that hinders and so easily entangles me. Let me run the race with endurance. Give me the mind of Christ instead of my own mind. Let me keep in step with the Spirit so that I'm not keeping in step with the flesh. Psalm 118. That's the psalm that Peter used with the cornerstone for the Pharisees. He would have told them, hey, I quoted this scripture. I don't know if they sat down and read that scripture right then or not, but they would have known somewhat of what that scripture was because it was one of their songs that they sang in their hymnal. Even if we messed it up when we were singing it up here, we kind of know the words to it. <laughs> no offense, Debbie. I would mess up worse. <laughs> but you know some of those. Without the words up there on the wall, though, you're like, wait a minute, what did it say here? But I know some of them because they sang them over and over again. Well, here's what Psalm 118 says. Give thanks individually and collectively, to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let all of Israel say, but Israel didn't want to say it, the leaders of, the, of Israel, but the leaders of the church were coming out saying it. His love endures forever. They're saying it because they're united in mind, they're united in mission, and they're united in prayer. Verse 3, let the house of Aaron say His love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say His love endures forever. When hard-pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. I wonder if they're thinking right then what Jesus Christ has done for them and will do for them for all eternity. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. Boy, I needed that verse right then if I were the, that people that day and heard all the threats. I won't be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Verse 7, the Lord is with me. He is my helper. Helper, I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than trust in princes. And all of the different leaders, the religious leaders were there that day. Verse 10, all the nations surround me, but, the name of the Lord, but in the name of the Lord I cut them down. They surround me on every side, but in the name of the Lord I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. <laughs> I have victory in Jesus, don't I? I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength. He is my defense, and He has become my salvation. You know, Peter was thinking those words when he said the next words that are coming up. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live. Now I remember the words of Jesus that says He's come to give abundant life. And He told me to go back and pray for the Spirit so that the Spirit would come and give me the power to live a life that would transform me into a little Christ. I will not die but live, and I will proclaim. There's the next words written in Psalm 118. What the Lord has done for me. The Lord has chastened me severely, but He has not given me over to death. He's given me new birth, new life, born, of the, born as a child of God. Open for me the gates of the righteous, and I will enter. One of the things that the classes that I went to yesterday talked about how... A lot of Christians, one reason because they don't study God's Word to be approved like they should, stay back here and they're saved. And Paul talks about that as one passing through the flames, but his work not surviving. And they're, they're saved. 
but they never live by the power of the Spirit because they never understand the calling of God and the authority and the power they have. What a shame. Jesus died so that you would live abundant life. This is the gate, verse 20, of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation as opposed to the opposite of that, right? The very next verse is the stone that the builders rejected because they won't have eternal life because they rejected Jesus. And they said, quit preaching in Jesus' name. Quit preaching resurrection in Jesus' name because they rejected Jesus. Jesus, but he has become the cornerstone. Brings me back to Matthew when Jesus is at the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, what is he? A wise man. You could have finished it for me. I know you know that one. He is a wise man who built his house on the rock. Verse 23 of um, Psalm 118, the Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes, our eyes. We all see this, we're in one accord, we pray the same prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The Lord has done it this very day, let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord save us, Lord grant us success. Success, how can you have success if you're not a soldier knowing that you're going into battle? If you're not an athlete competing to win? if you're not a farmer planting seed. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are those who feet, the feet of those who spread the good news. From the house of the Lord we bless you. Verse 27, the Lord is good and he has made light shine on us with boughs in his hand. Join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar where Jesus died for me. <laughs> Verse 28, you are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Before we get back or before we start again, I guess get back because we've been in Acts 4 already. Sometimes I don't get there yet even though I'm planning on getting there. But before we get there, I want to look at Jesus' words again in Matthew 7, since I gave you a teaser of that. Because I gave you verse 24. One thing when you're studying Scripture, don't just take that verse. As so many Christians do. I know that verse. I know what it means. But I haven't studied to show myself approved unto God, and I'm not rightly handling the word of truth because I'm taking one verse. Here's what Jesus said prior, starting in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. So many people think they're building their lives on the rock. But let me, let me ask you this. Are you building? And my question is not to, to you to c convict you or point fingers at you. It's Christianity as a whole in this country. Are you content with where you're at? You're saved? Or are you building the kingdom? Jesus put it into our hands until He comes as good stewards. So you've got to be building something. Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform my, many miracles? Those are, those are great things, but they don't necessarily build. And they're done with the wrong motive. Was, we know that. But in the name of Jesus, many, many mighty miracles can be done. But are you building something? Oh, wait a minute. These guys, they were building something. These that cast out mighty miracles. They were building a foundation that would be washed away. We're going to see that in just a little bit. Because their foundation was not Jesus Christ. You're building on what He taught, what He did, which is exactly what the church will turn out doing in Acts chapter 4. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Verse 24, Therefore everyone who hears these words and puts them into practice, not the mighty miracles, 
but into practice the other words that Jesus has said. I challenge you to go back and read what all he says in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. The ones who, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like what? A wise man, a wise builder, builder who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams, so we're reading after verse 24 now. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. I wonder again if the church is remembering these words. And they say, you know, there's no threats that the religious leaders can give us. There's no punishment that they can lay upon us. Because I have victory in Jesus. I have eternal life. And he has commanded me to be his hands and feet. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Why? Because it had a foundation on the rock. But everyone opposed here that hears the words of mine and does not put them into practice. Jesus does this so many times. He tells us what to do, and he even tells us the blessings and things, but he also tells us what will happen if we don't do it. Everyone who hears these words of mine but does not put them into practice, he's like a foolish man, a foolish builder, who did still build. You're building for one kingdom or the other, who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I hope from this scripture you can see that you are a builder of one thing or the other. And I go back to Jesus' words that I say quite commonly. You're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. You're either gathering or you're scattering. So let's go back to Acts chapter 4 and see what the church did. Not what just they heard, but what they did as hearers and doers of the word. <clears throat> Verse 24, when they heard this, they raised their voices together first in prayer. So what did they pray? Sovereign Lord... They said, not one of them said, they said, You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. I'll give you glory for all of creation, give you glory for the breath of life. I was created in your image. Whatever you want to put with that. They knew those things. So did the, the Sadducees and the uh, experts and the scribes and everything else. But they didn't understand them and therefore they didn't put them into practice. <clears throat> you spoke by your Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father, David. You know, we don't know who wrote Psalm 118, but right here we do after the fact. We don't know from the scriptures. <laughs> you spoke through, your Holy, through the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father, David. Why do the nations rage and, and people plot in vain? He's actually quoting Psalm 2 here, but I give him credit for the Psalm 18 also. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against His anointed one. Indeed, that is exactly what happened. Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed. I'm thinking of a million other scriptures, but I'll go way longer if I go down that road. They did what your power and your will had decided beforehand should happen. All right, I've got to go back to the scriptures now about the power that was coming when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Psalms 2 reads this way since it was just quoted in the prayer. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? Oh, that brings me such comfort that day if I'm there. Because I've heard these threats, I'm scared. I know what they did to Jesus but all this plotting that they're doing, that I don't know what words they did behind closed doors, it's all in vain. <laughs> Why do they do this? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against His anointed one, Jesus. Don't preach in His name. Don't mention Jesus' name. We can't deny His, His resurrection, but we want you to stop preaching about Him. <clears throat> Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. Break off the chains of religion. And let's live like Jesus. No matter whether the church over here does, the church doesn't over there. But as for me and my house and as for me and my church, we will serve the Lord. Verse 4, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. 
the Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords, and it's not a matter whether you'll proclaim it today or not. One day you will proclaim it. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. But I don't know for you, I'm going to proclaim him today with joy because I know that the victory's in him. I know that there is no threat that man can put upon me. I know that nothing can happen to me. Not a hair on my head will be touched if it's not in God's will. And if I die, it's gain for me, as Paul said. But as long as I still have breath, I'm going to proclaim the word of Jesus Christ. And we've seen it already, twice a filling of the Holy Spirit so they could proclaim. <clears throat> I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain, verse 7. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. And this is what he said to me. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possessions. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like potter. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son. Give allegiance to King Jesus. Or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up at any moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now if you study, you'll know that Psalm 1 is how a righteous man should live. Psalm 2 is the opposite of that. Psalm 2 is exactly what the Sadducees and the leaders of the law did that day, even though they knew Scripture because they didn't put it into practice. But the church prayed and quoted this Scripture... And then we're going to see that they put it in practice. Verse 29 of Acts chapter 4. Now, Lord, consider their threats and do what? Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. That should be underlined in your Bibles. If you underline in your Bibles. If you're not, just make a note, put it somewhere, put a bookmark. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Would that be our prayer? Not one of your prayers, not a two or three, but our prayer. Tomorrow, if you don't stop talking about Jesus, we're going to come in here and arrest all of you. We're going to take you out on the city streets. We're going to flog you, and then we're going to crucify you. Would that be your prayer? Nothing's changed the mission's the same. The Spirit of God is the same living inside of you. Would that be our prayer? Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand, verse 30, to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Why? Because we want these things or because we know these things will lead to opportunities for us to preach the gospel message again. Or we want healing to our lameness so we can get up and walk and go. Or we just want healing because we want to be healed so we can go do our own thing. I guarantee you with the thought process that was here, they wanted these miracles to happen to show the mighty finger of God so that they could tell mightily, boldly, what God has done for them through Jesus Christ. After they prayed, verse 31, the place where they were meeting, where they were meeting was shaken. Third filling of the Holy Spirit. Why? So that they could proclaim the message of Jesus Christ and His resurrection boldly. Now, I said before, and I don't go down this rabbit trail, that in some denominations this becomes a dividing factor about how the Holy Spirit fills you. It shouldn't. And we were talking yesterday about some other dividing factors in different denominations and so forth. And it shouldn't be a dividing factor. We should be united because we have a mission. We should be of one accord if we proclaim Jesus Christ as our Savior. We shouldn't quarrel as we read in Timothy over words and things. We should realize that we have a mission and the urgency of it and the blessing that we have of it the heavenly cosmic scales of being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. After they played, 
prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly. As a church, one body, one mind, one Savior, one Lord, one God in heaven, one Spirit, Verse 19, but Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. Uh, that means Peter threw the word right back onto them and it's right back on you today and I today and on anyone in the church. Are we going to do what's right in God's eyes? Or are we going to do what's right and acceptable in man's eyes? Scripture's clear. We're a holy priesthood, a sanctified people set apart to live holy lives so that we can proclaim the greatness, the goodness of God, His love, His mercy, and grace, no matter what the cost. And we don't need to worry or fear because nothing can take away our salvation. Verse 20, was Peter said, As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. The power of the Holy Spirit being used by the apostles, by the church. Now we can keep on a little bit. Verse 32 says, All the believers were one in heart and in mind. And what happened because of that? No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. Now, this is enough for a bunch of sermons. <laughs> but what did they do? They said, we've got a mission. We're listening to all the things that Jesus has to say, and it takes me back to all of them, the rich fool and the, the young rich man that came and said, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And the fact that Jesus talks more about money than, than probably any other topic and it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom and, I, and you will serve one master or the other. You can't serve both God and money. The love of money is a root of... And I can keep on going. They were of one heart and one mind and said, the things of this world belong to the creator of all things. And we're just stewards of them. And it seems like to us right now in this one mind and one accord that we don't want any needy people among us. They didn't all sell anything, sell their property. As we find out in chapter 5, you didn't have to give it all if you did sell it. This is what the Spirit led them to do so that there were no needy people among them. It's not Christian communism. It doesn't mean you've got to go sell everything. That's why I said we could spend forever on it, but I'll go past that. No one claimed that, that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. There's no jealousy. There's no envy. Look at the Ten Commandments. The first ones are God. The second ones are people. And they, they involve my covetousness and my jealousy and, and everything else. They got rid of that so that they could do the mission. Verse 33, because of that, it, as a attribute, or a, uh, I don't know what word I'm looking for, but it's not just because, because I don't want to say because, because then you think this is why the Holy Spirit did this, but you get to see what the Holy Spirit did. How's that? With great power. Not just power, but great power. Greater things you will do, church. <laughs> With great power, the apostles continued to testify to what? The resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Do you remember the three Ps from last week? Prayer, was that one? Proper living? Proclaiming. I got a fourth P for you to help you remember those three Ps. And you aren't going to forget this fourth P. <laughs> Pituitary. <laughs> what? Okay, pituitary, prayer, proper living, proclaiming. Why did he go with pituitary? Because the pituitary gland is a pea-sized organ, the organ, that must function properly 
or the body doesn't function properly. Hmm. Because it releases hormones, it releases hormones. It releases the power, however you want to put that, that tell the other glands what to do, and then they need to respond properly to that. They have to be functioning properly. And one of the things that it does, besides vision, mood, energy, is it stimulates the brain. Now, I know this isn't a direct correlation, but Jesus and the Spirit and God the Father are one. We, we can get into that another day. And God lives inside of me, and the Spirit reveals Jesus to me, and Jesus is the mind that controls the body. If I'm not letting the pituitary gland, which I can't even see, and no disrespect in the Holy Spirit whatsoever, just using that as an analogy. If I don't let the Holy Spirit, whom I can't see, which a lot of Christians never even properly experience, if they are in fact Christians, if I'm not letting that power come through me, I'm never going to have my mind stimulated to be like Christ. Do you see where I'm trying to go with that? And it's something I don't even know is in there or anything else, but so important. So the Holy Spirit, but that I labeled as pituitary in this case, don't come back later and throw stones at me, is what drives this whole process again, that we pray, that we live proper lives so that we can proclaim Jesus Christ in spite of persecution and so that we can see mighty miracles happen, people come to the Lord, whatever it is. We didn't make the Holy Spirit do this. We were part of the process. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The prayer is not what did it, but the prayer was what God worked through to do these things. He's called you to be prayerful, to, to rely on the Holy Spirit, to live a proper life, to proclaim. And three times we've seen the filling of the Holy Spirit so that they could proclaim the message of Jesus. From time to time, this is verse 34 again, those who own land or houses, not all the time, for, for from time to time, prepositional phrase tying it together, the ones who did own land or houses sold them. What they do when they sold them? They brought the money from the sales, whatever portion they decided to give, and they put it at the apostles' feet so that it could be distributed. We'll see some later when we go into Acts about this distribution and stuff. But as you read here in verse 35, it was distributed to anyone who had need. And then we see an encouraging example, which we're going to read more about this gentleman later. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, he sold a field that he owned, and he brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. That's where I'm stopping with Scripture. But I'm going to ask you a question. What are you willing or not willing to sell, give up, change in your life, whatever it is, to proclaim so that the kingdom of God comes, the church of Jesus Christ builds? Because you as a wise builder should be, should be building. And I hope I made it clear from Scripture, you are building. Jesus was clear about it. But as a wise builder, are you building on the foundation which is Jesus Christ? You've got to be proclaiming to be building. You've got to be getting rid of the sin in your life so that you can live a proper life. You've got to be listening to the Holy Spirit, keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. Are you doing those things? Or is something keeping you from doing it? Are you willing to get rid of it for King Jesus? The Acts 4 church is not a church that's dead and gone. It's Jesus' church that's still alive today. It's just we don't see as many as examples of it as we should. The mission is still the same. And in my opinion, I always put that in there when it's my opinion, I think there's as much urgency today as there was with the first Christians. <laughs> If you don't see that coming, then open your eyes.
Do you know what Barnabas did? What he did was encouraging, right? Do you know what that word is from the Greek word? You probably do. Paraclesis. Does that sound familiar? Does too. <laughs> Paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the one that Jesus gave to us, He is comforting, He is encouraging. And I can go on and on and on, and that is the word, a form of that word used for Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Because as you read in Corinthians, as you read other places, one of the reasons that, that we've been given comfort to the Lord is so that we can give comfort to you. So that we can give encouragement to you. So what Barnabas did was comforting, encouraging, and he had no regret, no thought process. He was compelled by the Holy Spirit to say, none of the things of this world matter. I won't wake, walk away sad like that young rich ruler did that day. I will sell it all and I will follow Jesus. And as you read through Acts, you'll see that his encouragement went and got Paul and got Paul started. And you don't ever even hear that much about Barnabas again because he wasn't worried about passing the baton on to Paul. All he cared about was being the servant that Jesus Christ had called him to be. Now that's encouraging. I can't wait to be in heaven and, and talk to him. I don't know what Jesus is calling you to do. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is compelling you to do. But I am going to ask again, what are you not willing to do? Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man or builder who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. That's hurricane force winds if you study the scripture. Yet it did not fall because it, its foundation was built upon the rock. But... Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man or builder because the next words say, who built his house on the sand. The rains came down, the stream rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I have the example of the Acts 4 church and what they did presented before me. So I have to ponder that and say, Lord, what are you telling me with my life? And you have those same questions. And I have to ponder before me, is there anything keeping me? Is there anything more important? Is there any other gods I have before him? Do I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength? Do I love my neighbor as myself? So I'm going to close with a prayer for boldness. <laughs> to live a life and proclaim Jesus. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for this church. I especially say right off, I thank you that we had more teachers, more leaders, volunteers, servants than we had students. What, a, what an amazing problem to have. Lord, I also pray that you bring in the students, that you give us a heart for Jesus, that you... Give us a heart to study your word so that we will be an approved workman before you that rightly handles the word of truth so that we will not be ashamed and that we will train up disciples, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. And I pray, Lord, that, that your word will not be void. And, and, and I can just pray on and on and on. And I thank you that your spirit will pray for me even when I don't have the words to say, whether it's in my moanings and groanings or in my defense, Lord. I thank you that the Spirit comforts me and encourages me, and I thank you that I have fellow brothers and sisters in the flock that do the same thing for me. Lord, help us be united, not divided. And Lord, I pray personally for myself to not let any other gods come before you. Lord, I thank you that Jesus Christ gave up everything to save me, and I long for the day when he returns to gather me up into his kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.